pastor will be back, but uh, I, I want to have you open your Bibles today to Luke chapter 22. I want to talk about a scripture today that has had me confused for many years. Now, often people think preachers are supposed to know all the answers to all their questions. I get amused by that. People come up to me and say, can you explain to me the seven-headed beast and the ten horns? And I just simply say, no. So I don't know what that means. Let me just assure you, any preacher that tells you he understands everything in the Bible, mark him because he'll lie to you about other stuff. It's very important to understand there's things we don't understand. But often, it's like the man sitting on the park bench and the agnostic come by and said, do you understand everything you're reading? And he looked up and said, no, sir, but what I do understand has me extremely concerned. How many of you know that we may not understand everything, but we need to obey what we do understand? Amen. And this scripture's had me somewhat puzzled for years until I understood through other scriptures how to interpret it. It's found in Luke chapter 22, verse 35. And Jesus said unto them, When I sent you out without purse or scripts or shoes, did you lack anything? And they said, Nothing, Lord. In fact, this account is also found in Matthew 26 and in Mark 14. And you'll find out who was the spokesman for the group. Would anybody like to guess who it was? Huh? It's Peter. Because how many of you know Peter was always talking even if he didn't know what he was saying. In fact, Peter talked so much, God spoke out of heaven and told Peter to shut up on the Mount of Transfiguration. How many of you know when God speaks out of heaven and tells you shut up, you might be talking too much? So they said, Jesus said, when I sent you out and you didn't have purse or script or shoes, or anything, did you lack anything? And Peter said, everybody say Peter said, nothing. We didn't lack anything. And he said unto them, But now he that hath the purse, let him take it, and he that hath scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this is said that it may be accomplished in me. For he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, say Peter said, <laughs> as he's the one that's saying he said Lord we have two swords and Jesus says that's enough let's pray Father we thank you for your word this morning we thank you Lord for the opportunity to share it with your chosen people give us ears to hear and understanding hearts and obedient wills help me to speak what only you would give me Lord that I may be able Lord to plant a seed that will bring forth fruit to your kingdom and glory to your name for it's in the name of Jesus I pray. And everyone in agreement together said, Amen and Amen. Now let me explain to you before I get started today that there is a law called the law of hermeneutics. And hermeneutics is just a big word that I didn't know what it meant for a long time. But what hermeneutics means is that Scripture interprets Scripture. See, that's the danger of pulling a Scripture out of context. Now, I remember when I first got saved, and maybe some of you are doing this. That's why I'm going to confess my sins, not just so you know them, but so you can identify. But how many of you know sometimes we try to get a word, and we don't know how to get a word, so we pull a scripture out of context. So I used to open my Bible, and I would do like this. And I'd look down, and it said, Judas went out and hung himself. And I decided I didn't want that scripture, so I flipped over a few more pages and did that number and put it down, and it said, go and do likewise. <laughs> then I did it again, you know, and it said, what you do, do quickly. How many of you know if that's the way you interpret scripture, it looks like you're supposed to commit suicide very quickly. But the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. You find those words in Matthew. And they trace back to Deuteronomy where it said that no man could die but by the witness of two or three. So when you're 
studying scripture it's important that you understand scripture interpret scripture and what is important is explained by other scriptures once you find the key to that verse and that's what I want to share with you today because Jesus is telling them by a sword now I don't even know Peter personally but just reading the Bible how many of you know Peter did not need to be armed There's 400 soldiers coming in armor, ironclad. Jesus has got 11 renegades that have never been militarily trained. Do you think Jesus is so militarily inept that he thought 11 ragtag renegades with two swords? And by the way, let me explain to you sword there where Peter said, we have two of them, was not a sword sword. It was actually just a little knife, a bayonet. Now, Peter's not the sharpest pencil on the cup. And so Peter says, we got two of them. And Jesus says, that's enough. And Peter says, yeah. <laughs> 400 people are coming with actual swords, with armor on. Peter has got a knife. I'm symbolizing with a rubber knife because it's about that significant. Jesus is not believing for Levin Renegade, his ragtag team, to conquer 400 people. It's apparent that he had Peter to bring this bayonet to teach an object lesson. That's what I'm going to teach this morning. But when the armies come... Peter whacks off Malchus's ear because he don't have enough sword to penetrate a vital organ. He cuts off Malchus's ear. And Jesus, this is one of the greatest miracles of Jesus, I think, because Jesus had nothing at all to gain out of this. But he reaches down and picks up Malchus's ear and puts it back on because he needs to hear what Jesus is about to say. Heals his ear. And what begins to happen is, Jesus begins to teach an object lesson here. Now, this same story is in Matthew 26. And if you go to verse 52, Jesus rebukes Peter. He says to him, put your bayonet up. Because if you live by this bayonet, you will die by this bayonet. Now, what had me confused as a homeless man on house arrest, is why would Jesus tell him to buy a sword and then rebuke him for using it? You ever thought about things like that? Why would he say to him, put that sword away? What are you doing with that sword? Jesus had just told them to buy it. Peter standing there thinking, Lord, I thought I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. I, I was whacking off. <laughs> Malchus is here. I was trying. I didn't have a lot to work with. But Jesus is teaching something here because we know that this is in the context of before he's arrested. And we know that Jesus has said to his disciples, come and pray with me. And one scripture said he took Peter, James, and John a little farther than he did the others. And he said, pray with me. And he comes back in an hour and they're asleep. Man, imagine this, the most critical hour in your life, the most difficult hour in your life. You've surrounded yourself by the last 11 people that really believe in you. You're asking them to pray for you because you're fixing to lay down your life. And they go to sleep. And Jesus wakes them <laughs> and says to them, can you not tarry with me one hour? Can you not pray with me? Do you not understand that I'm fixing to go through my most difficult hour? Can you not pray with me? And the answer ultimately is no, because as soon as he leaves, they go back to sleep again. And then, <laughs> Scripture indicates that Jesus prays another hour by himself. So he prayed between two and three hours that he would be able to stand in his hour of temptation. But the next verse following, verse 52 in Matthew 26 
Jesus makes a statement to them when he tells Peter to put up his sword. Do you not know that I can now? Everybody say now. He said, I can now call on the Father. Presently. He uses two words to show that something has happened in their two and a half, three hour nap. And I'm telling you, I have come to a time of my life, I appreciate naps. Is anybody with me? I know why God speaks to old men in dreams. He cannot keep old men awake. <laughs> if I sit down in a chair, I'm going bye-bye. You throw a blanket on me, I don't know when I'll be back. Amen? <laughs> They've been napping. Jesus has been praying, and something has changed. He said, do you not now know that I could presently ask my father, and he would send to me 12 legions of angels? Would you like to know how many 12 legions? of angels are. It's estimated this between 75,000 and 96,000 angels. Now let me explain to you, when an angel shows up with a sword, that can be an amazing sight to see. Because their scripture says one angel took out 186,000. Listen, if you happen to see an angel with a sword, don't cop an attitude. Because <laughs> angels with swords are bad to the bone. He said, I could call 96,000 angels presently. What is he referencing? He's referencing while they're asleep with their rubber knife, he, through prayer, listen to me, is amassing the armies of heaven to war on his behalf. How important is prayer? How important is it that we raise our prayer coverage? What does the word prayer coverage mean anyway? <laughs> Damien talked about me adding him to my prayer list. And I cover them in prayer. What does that actually mean? That means I call on the armies of heaven to overshadow them. Do you understand when we pray Angels war? Brother Rick, where did you get that? When Daniel prayed, Michael warred for 21 days. You don't really think you're going to change your destiny with your rubber knife, do you? You don't really think you've got any kind of defense that will work in taking the enemy out of your life and out of your family, do you? You don't think you have the ability to square off with him, do you? Wow. Say that backwards, wow. <laughs> your victory is found in his victory. Your victory is found in the fact that you must learn to lay down your knife and call on the swords of heaven. I want to bear this out in Scripture because Paul takes up the same thing in Ephesians chapter 12. Ephesians chapter 12, or chapter 6, verse 12. It says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. I had this on my calling card when I was a pastor because I wanted to remind myself every day that I was to get up, but I wasn't to put on boxing gloves and take on the devil. He was trying to kill me, but how many of you know the easiest way to die is try to box with him? Blow for blow. Damon started the service today saying many of our families are under attack. My question is, what is our response to that attack? What is our, how are we going to react? Because let me tell you, how you wage war in the heavenlies, and that's, a, that's the title to my message today, waging war in the heavenlies. How you wage war will determine whether you will win it or lose it. And the number one way to lose it is with your rubber knife. Now, Paul says we don't wrestle against these things. Then he begins to tell us the three weapons 
by which we implement war. He says, so we put on the whole armor of God. Now, we don't understand armor. I, I'm almost 62 years old. I've never actually ever seen anyone wearing a full suit of armor. You don't even see that after midnight at Walmart, and you can see anything being war at midnight at Walmart. And I've never even seen that at Walmart. I've never been standing in the aisle at Walmart and heard something going clink, 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 and look around, and here comes somebody by in armor. I've never seen that. Has anyone ever seen anybody just walking around in a full suit of armor? We don't even have a concept of what this is now. When this is written by the hand of Paul, all of Israel is under Roman rule, and armor is as common as our clothes are. Roman armor, however, is very unique. Now, see, the first weapon we have is the armor of God. The armor, because you were completely covered, had insignias on it. So you could tell who the armor belonged to. So if the insignia said King George, then apparently underneath all of that metal was King George. We are wearing the armor of, say it loud, which means the devil don't know it's you unless you're stupid enough to raise that little visor and say, hello, it's me in here. How many of you know there'd be two words for that? Stupid. In other words, you lose your accent. Oh, listen, you're not hearing me. You lose your identity in the cross of Jesus. Galatians 2.20 said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet it's not me living. For the life I now live, I live by the faith of, everybody say of, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Listen, my victory is in the fact that the victor lives inside of me and my identity is lost in the cross of Jesus Christ. But the Roman armor had a major flaw as far as I am concerned because though their entire front side was covered with metal, there was nothing on the back side. Can you imagine this? Walking this way, you're fully covered. Turning this way, you are totally exposed. Really cut down on desertion. No one ever deserted in the Roman army. There were a lot of people killed. But no one ever deserted because when they turned around, they were dead. So they learned to the battle. Come here, Judd, help me, bud. They learned the battle. Now, I'm talking about your weapons of warfare. How many of you noticed it said the weapons, plural, of your warfare? Turn around and put your shoulders to my shoulder. This is the way they wore it, smart guys. Because they realize if I war and he's warring and he's got armor on his side and I got armor on my side, then I'm covered. Now, the fellow back here was referred to as the paraclete. How many of you know what that word means? It's the name given to the Holy Spirit, meaning the one who has come alongside. Now, we think he's come. Come here, Joe, because I don't mind embarrassing you. I love you that much. <laughs> I'm holding Judd's hand. I know that he's muscular. <laughs> when I went to Africa, this guy that showed me around the village, he helped my hand. I'm really going to embarrass you here because what he did was he helped my hand like this for an hour. <laughs> I have never felt that awkward except now <laughs> in my entire life. Well, that's kind of what we did in the village. But what he did was he walked around the village introducing me to everybody like this. My hand was sweating. I can't even tell you how bad it was sweating. And uh, he would introduce me, and he would walk me around. One hour he did this. It's the most humiliating hour of my life. And then he got back to his little hut, and he said, You know why I'm holding your hand? And I said, No, but I'll be thankful when you let it go. 
And he said, I want everyone that knows me to know that I'm not ashamed to be attached to you. My embarrassment turned to gratitude. See, the Holy Spirit didn't come to skip with you through life. He come to cover your vulnerability and to reinforce your loss of identity. This is a weapon that will give you victory when you realize you're wearing the armor of God and the Holy Ghost has got your back. Look at your neighbor and say, the Holy Ghost got my back. Yeah, you better realize if the Holy Ghost didn't have your back, you'd be shot full of more holes and we could help you count. Are you hearing me? The only reason you have survived is because the Holy Ghost has got your back. That's the only reason you're alive. He has covered you in your realm of vulnerability and all of us have vulnerabilities. My Lord, we're not perfect people. We serve a perfect God. And it's the Holy Ghost that has got my back. And the armor of God has got me covered so that my identity and my vulnerability will not be my death. Wow. Y'all say that with me backwards? Wow. Second weapon. is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is not only my defense against the enemy, but it is my offense against the enemy because I'm covered in the armor of God. The Holy Ghost has got my back and God has given me his word. Now think again, if I'm covered in the armor of God and I'm speaking the word of God, guess who he thinks he's fighting? Unless you raise the little window. He's not running from you. He's running from him who has already defeated him. You're not walking in your victory. You are walking in the victory of him who loved you and gave himself for you. Boy, that ought to make a statue of jump up and down in a mummy twirl if you're hearing what I'm saying. We are victorious in Jesus. But there's another weapon. Not only do we have the armor of God and the sword of the Spirit, but Paul says praying, praying always with all prayer and supplication. Why? Because when you pray, Over top of having the armor of God and the word of God, you amass the army of God in your behalf. The Bible says angels are ministering spirits sent to minister on behalf of the saints. Are you hearing me? Boy, y'all are quiet this morning. I know Richie would already let you go to lunch. Just hang with me a minute. I'm trying to help you. Look at your neighbor and say, he's trying to help us. You have to utilize your weapons if you're going to walk in his victory. You're going to have to put on the armor of God. Then you're going to have to put on the Holy Spirit of God. Then you're going to have to use the word of God. And then you're going to have to pray for the armies of God. That's why I'm putting a plea out to the church that we may increase our prayer coverage in this church because we are experiencing new levels of enemy attack with the same level of prayer coverage we've had in the past. How many of you can personally say, the battle in my family is intensified and it's easy to see it? Lift your hand. See, that's why I'm teaching you on how to walk in the victory he's made available to you. It's very important you hear this. Now I'm going to close for the first time by you turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 and 5 because... We know that God desires us to walk in the victory that he's made available. We know that he's given us the weapons to walk in victory. But what does this really look like? What does it look like for me to amass the armies of heaven? We know that Jesus prayed 
and 96,000 angels gathered above his head. We know that he was teaching Peter an object lesson. But let's look at what it says. In 2 Corinthians, give me a second to get there, I'm crying. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. Now the weapons of our warfare are not, what does that mean to you? That means it ain't your rubber knife. The weapons of our warfare are not fleshly ideas. This is what we need to do. This is our plan to stand against the devil. You don't need to devise a plan to stand against the devil. God already has a plan to stand against the devil. You need to adopt his. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty. Everybody say mighty. Through God. That tells you how they're mighty. This is really powerful. To the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, let me share with you that there are several points that are being made here. And I want to... Uh, to show you visibly and then explain to you what I'm showing you. Because if we follow Peter's example and we've got our rubber knife. You got your rubber knife with me? Do your hand like this. Because you've been trying to fight your own battles with your own strength. You're losing. Now what happens is in the midst of this you begin to cry out to God. Landon, come here. You begin to cry out to God. Now, when you begin to cry out to God, God begins to hear you and amasses an army over your head. This is what's happening in the spirit. Now, how many of you believe he's more threatening than I am with a rubber knife? But here's the problem. We keep crying out, but we won't lay down our rubber knife. Because we think we need to be part of the God squad that straightens out every era in the world. Can I hear an amen so I don't think you're guilty? We feel like there's something we can do to make a difference in our victory. That's the biggest lie from hell you'll ever hear in your life. Your victory is found in the finished work of Jesus. There is nothing you can do to add to or take away from what he has done. So you keep crying out. Come up here, Shane. Judd, help me. And here's what happens. The angels begin to gather in the heavenlies. You can't see them, but they're there. And all of a sudden, you keep crying out with your rubber knife, thinking you're making a difference. And there is a blanket coverage that takes place above your head. Look how stupid I look with my rubber knife now. Because the devil can see in the realm of the spirit, and he knows that God is waiting on one thing. See, this scripture actually says the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but they're mighty. Now, the word there is the word dunatos. It comes from the word dunamis, which means the inherent power of God. But dunatos means the possible, capable power. See, the word dunamis actually is where we get our word dynamite. How many of you know the word dynamite conjures up an image of something that looks similar to a cigar in a box <laughs> with a string hanging out of it. Not exactly intimidating until it's ignited. Because when you ignite that, people start moving real quick. Because they know once ignited, twice exploded. They're gone. We have available to us the army of God. But it's never ignited until we lay down our knife. Then he begins to cover us. No, he really covers us. He covers all of us. 
and we are now under the covering of heaven unless we start peeping out. Now, here's what we do. We say, oh, God, help us, help us, Jesus, help us, Jesus. And all of a sudden, things start changing. Okay, I got it here. And we start picking up a rubber knife again. Guess what happens? We lose our blanket coverage. We expose ourselves to the enemy again. And once again, we become vulnerable to the attack of the enemy. There's five things I want to give you. Thank you, fellas. Thanks for taking that blanket off of me, too, because I was about to explode <laughs> in the flames. There's five things you need to know. Here they are. Write them down. Don't write them on a Kleenex, blow your nose, and lose your message. Write them on something you intend to keep because the battle's going to intensify. Let me tell you, there's five things you need to do. Number one, you need to realize God's unlimited inherent power. There is nothing he can't do. I said there is nothing he can't do. Your family members have not went too far that he can't touch them. Jim, come up here with me, buddy. I'm going to embarrass you a little while. For 25 years, I prayed for this guy. 25 years. And he got progressively worse for 25 years. I remember saying to mom, six months before he was born again, I don't think he's ever going to change. My mama's response. Now, my mama was 5'3", laying down, standing up. It didn't make a difference. It didn't clench you. Same size, every direction. She's the first prophet I ever met. She'd say, I'll beat you within an inch of your life. About an inch from us dying, she would quit beating us. And then say... Wait till your daddy gets home. We'd wonder if he was going to swallow us or what was next. My Lord, she had killed us. But I remember saying to her, I don't think Jim's going to change. And I remember her response. She said, listen to me, buddy boy. Now, when my mom called you buddy boy, you wasn't her buddy, and I'm not sure you were her boy. <laughs> that name meant she's in trouble. And she said, you can quit if you want to, but as long as I have breath, my last breath, I'll say, <gasps> save Jim. She refused to call off the armies of heaven. Jim is standing here today born again. Now listen to me. He wasn't born again because he was in a revival meeting. He wasn't born again because he was listening to someone preach the gospel. He was actually walking down the road to continue the lifestyle he was in. When God in heaven lifted him from where he was to where he could see himself. Am I telling you the truth? And he saw a man wrapped in chains. And when the man looked around, it was him. And the power of the Holy Spirit set him free and changed his life forever. What is he? What am I? A product of prayer because we had a mother that would refuse to relent but called on God for the angels of heaven to intervene in the life of her children. You tell me prayer don't make a difference. Wait, when I went to Dallas, Texas, tried to get away from my mama's prayers, I heard her more then than I did when I was sitting in the house. Because every day she says, sick him, Holy Ghost. Don't let him have a minute of peace. Are you hearing me? And we're trying to wage war with a rubber knife. God in heaven, wake us up to real life. The unlimited inherent power is waiting to be ignited by the prayers of the people of Christian fellowship. It's not an automatic thing. It's inherent and it has to be ignited. Number two, you got to change your mind and quit reacting in the flesh and start acting in the spirit. Are you hearing me? Change your way of thinking. What's causing my defeat? I continue to do the same thing, expecting different results. God help us. I was in the office one day, and I got a prayer request on the phone. How many of you know I love to laugh? How many of you know I laugh at the wrong times? 
How many of you know when I laugh, it's not he, he, and I'm back? Because when I get tickled, I need oxygen. I'm laying in the floor. <coughs> and someone called right over here. The office was right over here. I had a telephone in my hand. Now, when people speak, I see pictures because I'm elementary. And when I see the picture, I react accordingly, What? no matter what they're saying. A guy called in. He said, I need prayer. And I said, okay. I said, why? He said, because I was chopping a hickory stump, and I hit this stump, and the axe come back and hit me in the head. And I started smiling and holding the telephone out here so he couldn't hear me if I was snickering because I could see this in my mind. And then he said, twice. Listen, when he said twice, I don't even remember who come by, but I just handed the telephone. They thought it was for them. I had to do some floor time. How many of you know if you keep doing this, it ain't the stump It's hard. You have got a problem. Something's hard, but it's not the stump. Why do we keep battling with a rubber knife that has never brought us victory in the 20 years we've used it? When the armies of heaven are awaiting your prayers, change your mind. Number three, change your strategy. The word imagination there is the feminine derivative of strategy. The strategy of what it actually means is that we keep going back to our fleshly tendencies rather than our spiritual calling. Wow. We react. So we got to change our mind first. We got to renew our mind, know what the word says we have. And then we got to change our strategies and quit going back to imaginations. Imaginations, it calls them vain imaginations because they don't accomplish anything. And then this. Once we change our strategy, we got to implement it. We got to use our weapons of war. And we got to use them consistently. And we got to keep on praying just like mom did for Jim and for me until she sees the result. She would not relent, Jim. That's why you're saved. I'll be honest. I hate to confess with you. I was willing to give it up six months before you had that experience. But when mama wouldn't let me give it up, I kept praying with her. And the prayer of agreement the reason you're here today. Refuse to relent on God's strategy. It will work. Well, I've been praying for a week and it hadn't happened yet. I started praying for my family when mom died October 8, 1994. And every day I prayed over them. But there's times when they got on my last nerve and jumped up and down. I'll be perfectly honest. Got a nephew. I, I don't know whether I blessed him or cursed him or what. But I'd pray for him and then I'd say to the Lord, I'm sick of him. Because he got progressively worse. I'm so sick of him. And the Lord said, you need to make up your mind. A double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. You want me to bless him, save him? You want to send him to hell? What are you going to do? Talk to me. Changed my mind. Started calling on God. See, listen to me. When I was praying one day, I said, Lord, will they ever change? And I saw a sledgehammer in my mind. Now, listen, my mind's real vivid, and I have to keep it intact a lot because it wanders off. In fact, it did a couple times in this message. <laughs> but I saw this sledgehammer, and I thought it's the devil. How many of you know when you pray, and all of a sudden you see something weird, you think that's the devil trying to... So I said, sledgehammer, be gone. It got clear. How many of you know it's hard to rebuke God, especially when you're talking to him? It started getting clear and clear and clear, and I said, Lord, is that you? What are you trying to tell me? He said, when you swing a sledgehammer, does the concrete break the first time? Now, God don't talk to me like he does everybody else. I have never had him say, thou, I say it to thee. I mean, he just never has said that. He says stuff like, shut up, sit down. I understand God. I don't know how to figure out good interpretation. He said, when you swing a sledgehammer, does the concrete break the first time? I said, no. Then he asked me a second question, when does it break? I was like... I was like Ezekiel when he said, can these bones live? I said, thou knowest. Thou knowest what, I don't have a clue what lick breaks it. <laughs> then he said, how about you keep on swinging and leave the breakthroughs to me? How about you just keep on swinging that sledgehammer every day against those family members that's becoming more hard-hearted because one of these days the cracks are gone. 
compliment what he gave you. I'm almost done. Come to the music so they'll think I'm stopping. <laughs> Implement the strategy. And then I love this. Bring everything into the obedience of Christ. When you actually look at the translation to this, it's so beautiful. Because what it actually says is, obey me and put the issue to bed. Obey me and put the issue to bed. Wow. That's why I was under the blanket a while ago. Because see, once you lay down a rubber knife and you really believe this thing works, you don't have anything else to do but just keep swinging sledgehammer. You can rest at night because Jesus is keeping them up at any plan. He's bugging them every moment. The Holy Spirit saying, boy, you need to live, right? And I can go to Dallas, but I can't get away from him. You know why? Because the angels of heaven are not sleeping. They're warring that I may be free. Bow your heads and hearts with me. Who are you today and what are you battling? Are you trying to win a spiritual battle with a rubber knife? Are you guilty of faking that you're smart enough to figure a strategy to defeat the enemy? Have you grown weary and well-doing? <laughs> Have you swung the sledgehammer but you're willing right now to lay it down because you don't see the progress you thought you should have seen when you thought you should have seen it? But God this morning is calling us as a church to raise our level of prayer, to involve the angels of heaven, the army of God, to bring a victory to this area this area has never known. Brother Rick, it's been racially prejudiced. It's been this, it's been that ever since I lived here. Well, listen to me. Change, it is a coming. Are you hearing me? Change, it is a coming. Because God has called you. God has called you to a new level of prayer. You're here this morning. You have battled without results. Can I see your hand? You're battling right now. Just lift your hand real high. You got family members you're battling over right now. <laughs> Can you just stand to your feet all over this building? Everyone, just stand to your feet this morning. All over the world, there's an international sign of surrender. It's uplifted hands. They stick a gun in your back in Cairo, Egypt. You do the same thing you do in Marshall County. You put both hands over your head and open up your hands. That's what I want us to do this morning. I want you to lift your hands. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Father, I'm tired of warring with a rubber knife. When the angels of heaven are waiting to be engaged in my battle. I put on the armor of God. I pray to the Holy Spirit to cover me in my vulnerabilities. I change my mind to follow your will. I exchange my strategy for your strategy. And I know when I do so, I'll put this issue to bed forever. To you be the glory, praise and honor throughout all generations, worlds without end, in your church, right here at Christian Fellowship. Oh, I just let this message become a part of your heart right now God I just pray over these with uplifted hands I pray blessing over them right now in the name of Jesus no weapon formed against them can prosper because they belong to you we are a covenant people serving a covenant God that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think by his power that worketh in us release the armies of heaven over them as they choose to walk in your strategy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen.
Amen. If you need special prayer, there'll be folks here at the front to pray with you. Please consider coming back tonight and finding your place and learning to function. And if you kept time on how long I preached this morning, please do not text my pastor in Florida and tell him, okay? It'll be our little secret. See you tonight. God bless you. Love you with all my heart.